In this lecture, we'll be taking a look at the Spanish Civil War and its effects on the European geopolitical situation in the mid-1930s. This was a three-year conflict between Republicans and fascists in Spain. The war had started after a coup d'etat that was only partially successful, which was led by generals versus the popularly elected democratic government of Spain. Germany and Italy in the conflict backed the fascists, and the Soviet Union supported the Republicans along with the Mexico. Perhaps as many as a million people were killed in this conflict, which again had uh, broad geopolitical and military significance for the war that would emerge in Europe. The leader of the fascists in Spain at the time, Francisco Franco, born in uh, 1892, he took the title of Generalissimo. He had started out in the Navy as, uh, as a young man, switched to the Army in 1907. Um, was a leader in what was known as the Falange Movement, F-A-L-A-N-G-E. He shared uh, the contempt of Italian fascists for Bolshevism and other forms of socialism. He had also had a uh, rather significant dislike of democracy. Uh, like the black shirts of Italy, the Falange had a party militia, militia that was called the blue shirts. The official ideology of the Spanish fascist was something known as national syndicalism. This was a corporate state in which class struggle was superseded by a vertical trade union forcing workers and owners into one organization, somewhat similar to what Mussolini um, purported to enact in Italy during the 1920s, if you think back to the state corporatism. Uh, he was a staunch defender of Roman Catholicism. Uh, in terms of uh, demographic groups that he um, appealed to, uh, Castilian farmers uh, definitely was a group that he um, wanted to sway and persuade that he was in the right. Um, he had a, a very nationalist pride in the history of the Spanish Empire. Um, among his other ideologies, very anti-separatist, and we'll get to the issue of ethnic groups in Spain on the next slide, uh, avowedly anti-communist, anti-anarchist, somewhat anti-capitalist, and that's uh, kind of puzzling uh, for modern observers to be both anti-communist anti and anti-capitalist, but uh, more concerned about, not so much about profits, but about uh, the power that corporations have. So in that sense, he was anti-capitalist. Uh, definitely anti-democratic, anti-liberal, anti-parliament, and uh, definitely a fan of paramilitary groups, which he relied upon heavily to carry out some of his dirty work. Here's a picture of Franco in 1936 um, with a hand-picked um, National Assembly that declared him uh, the leader of the state. This is, of course, during the Spanish Civil War, so it wasn't a done deal at this time. Um, we tend to think of Spain today as a unified country, but the reality is that even in the 21st century, there are a variety of languages spoken in the country. Uh, today, there are four major official languages in Spain, plus over a dozen distinct dialects and unofficial languages spoken by people living in the country. Part of the conflict, thus, um, in the Spanish Civil War was related by efforts by the Franco government to impose the Castilian language and uh, culture on non-Castilian speakers. You can see in the in the image the lightest green represents people who um, are predominantly areas in which people speak Castilian. That would be uh, what we would call Spanish in the United States. Um, the darker green would be Galician speakers. The Basques who have a language that is not um, a Romance language. Um, in fact, it probably has, it's probably distantly related to a Celtic language more than anything else. But the linguists are not, um, not in agreement as to um, what language family to really put it because it's so different from anything else around it. And the Catalan speakers, 
uh, particularly centered, centered around the regions of Barcelona and Valencia. Uh, Barcelona in particular would become a rather um, significant hotbed of resistance to Franco's efforts. This is a recruiting poster from uh, the Catalan region from Barcelona, 1936. The caption reads something like, the militias need you. Um, there's several things happening in this poster that I find interesting. I, I'm especially intrigued by the, um, the depiction of a female figure exhorting people to join the militias. Um, this uh, gendered approach or breaking down of traditional gender roles was certainly um, something that the Republicans embraced. And it also flew in the face of traditional, um, traditional Spanish and Roman Catholic values for the time period. So uh, a, a radical departure, even though the, you know, the demands by today's standards of the Republicans are not particularly radical. The Spanish Civil War itself was billed as something of an ideological showdown between fascists and socialists or fascists and communists. Um, Hitler and Mussolini each proclaimed that their in intervention in Spain was to support Franco um, on an ideological basis. Both men, of course, came to power in large measure because of their stated opposition to left-leaning groups. However, for Germany and Italy, this was also a golden opportunity to test new weapons in combat, especially tanks and planes. And more importantly, their military personnel gained invaluable combat experience. And many leading German and Italian generals of World War II participated in some fashion in either the combat or logistics of the Spanish Civil War. A number of um, famous journalists and writers covered the war. Um, in fact, uh, the line between journalist and participant becomes blurred at times with some of these individuals. I've only put a few on here that are probably the most famous. George Orwell, who was uh, noted for the books, uh, the novels Animal Farm in 1984, uh, avowedly anti-totalitarian and uh, pro-democracy. Ernest Hemingway, um, American novelist famous for books like The Sun Also Rises, A Farewell to Arms, For Whom the Bell Tolls, I'm struggling here, The Old Man in the Sea, that's about all I got on Hemingway right now. Um, another interesting figure who covered the war was Martha Gellhorn, um, who was a journalist and, uh, and writer in her own right, uh, she traveled to Spain with Ernest Hemingway to cover the Spanish Civil War. They had met in, um, I think, 1936 in Key West, and somewhere they transitioned from friends into lovers and then became married in 1940, although Martha Gellhorn was a, a very um, unique individual for a time period in that uh, women typically didn't cover wars as, as war correspondents, so she was very um, groundbreaking in this sense, and she kind of resented marrying Hemingway because of his celebrity, and she didn't want to be seen as, uh, you know, maybe second bill, or the only reason she got where she was was because of Hemingway, because she was an established writer long before she met Hemingway. Uh, Gellhorn was hired to report for the, the magazine Collier's Weekly, um, and Gellhorn and Hemingway spent uh, Christmas of 1937 in Barcelona. Uh, later, Gellhorn would uh, report on uh, Nazi Germany. 1938, she was in Czechoslovakia and uh, covered many facets of the war throughout its duration. Um, she and Hemingway split, I think, in 1945. So the uh, the main showdown was uh, between nationalists and, and republicans. Uh, this a map or a series of maps shows you the change in time over territory controlled by each faction. Uh, some on the left were also decidedly anti-Catholic. Here we have some images of, uh, of uh, victims of anti-Catholic violence by some of the left-leaning groups. 
uh, thousands of nuns and priests were killed. In part, this was um, religious. It, it was more to do with politics than anything else, though, um, because the Roman Catholic Church was seen as uh, supporting fascism and the close ties it had with uh, Franco. So uh, it's a very unfortunate um, episode in the Spanish Civil War that uh, religious figures would be um, killed in this way. And I think uh, ultimately this was not a, a wise move for the Republicans, or at least those elements of the Republicans who engaged in this sort of uh, religious-themed terror. One of the most famous um, uh, aspects of the Spanish Civil War is something known as the Condor Legion. These were volunteers from the German Air Force, the Luftwaffe, and from the German Army, the Wehrmacht hier, that uh, served with the Nationalists from 1936 to 39. Um, technically, this was there was a degree of separation between the German government and the Condor Legion. Uh, it, there was no s uh, secret that Germany was was funding this um, effort. I mean, they supplied the tanks, the planes, the ammunition, the personnel. They created sort of a uh, a ruse organization to give them at least a some deniable or plausible deniability or whatever they the legal term is for that a cover might be a better word. Um, the Condor Legion developed uh, numerous methods of terror bombing that would later be used widely in the Second World War. The bombing of uh, Guernica by the Condor Legion was uh, easily the most infamous operation carried out by the Condor Legion, and we will cover that in another slide or two. Um, it's in its first operation, uh, uh, 20 Ju-52s flown by Lufthansa pilots carried the Spanish Army of Africa from Spanish Morocco to Spain. This was uh, Operation Magic Fire. Initially, it was funded with about 3 million Reichmarks. Uh, the first contingent of uh, 86 men left on the 1st of August in 1936. They did not know where they were going. They were not told. They were accompanied uh, by, uh, by six fighters. They also had anti-aircraft guns and about 100 tons of other supplies. And over the course of... Um, the course of the three years, the number of troops significantly increased over time. This particular mission, um, about 13,500 German and Italian troops um, participated. The bombing of Guernica is um, one of the most uh, notorious as well as unfortunate um, episodes in the Spanish Civil War. The, the Basque government at the time, and you can see Guernica on the map on the right, uh, extreme northern Spain in Basque territory. The Basque government reported uh, 1,654 people killed, but modern estimates are somewhere in the 300 to 400 person range, almost entirely civilians. Uh, the reason for the attack was that purportedly there were um, there were insurgents in the town, but uh, uh, it seems clear to most historians that this was uh, an attack uh, directly on civilians for the purpose of, uh, of terror. Um, there doesn't seem to be any real evidence that a, a significant insurgent presence was anywhere near here. The bombing also occurred on a, on a market day when the town square would be filled with uh, vendors and, uh, and, and uh, consumers looking to purchase food and um, domestic items, and this was a direct targeting of the town itself uh, by the Condor Legion, not, uh, you know, looking for elements of uh, Republican insurgents. This image shows some of the devastation of the bombing of Guernica. This is a quote from a, an eyewitness. A group of women and children were lifted high into the air, maybe 20 feet or so, and they started to break up legs, arms, heads, and bits and pieces flying everywhere. Very gruesome stuff. This is a poster um, calling the, uh, the attack that it was led by assassins, assassinos, showing some of the victims. And here we have children. The artist Pablo Picasso was uh, 
highly disturbed and uh, moved by the suffering in Guernica, and uh, he set about to um, put together his his thoughts on canvas, and the result was a, a painting called, not surprisingly, Guernica. This is an image of Guernica. There's a lot of different interpretations of it, and you can look them up online. I think um, I think it's safe to say that there um, there's some symbolism here that um, art, art historians and critics continue to debate, but uh, it gets a sense of the agony and the pain of uh, the innocent civilians killed. Um, Picasso insisted that the Guernica, the painting, should only return to Spain when Franco died. Now Franco, if you didn't know, um, and I'm giving away the end of the story here, but uh, uh, the, the fascists won the Spanish Civil War and Franco became a dictator for the next uh, three and a half decades. And Picasso insisted that this particular painting should not be in Spain as long as Franco lived. Um, while it was in New York City in 1974, a strange twist of fate or story, um, a war press protester, a Vietnam War protester, uh, defaced the uh, the painting in New York City um, with a, a spray paint. He he painted the words "Lies kill all," which is you know kind of uh, ironic since this is an anti-war painting, and you would think um, that uh, the the anti-war protester would have shared the sentiments of Picasso and found you know <laughs> maybe a pro-military painting to deface, but. Anyways, they were able to restore it, and, and fortunately, the, uh, uh, the the restoration process was very successful. In 1981, the painting was returned to Spain, um, taken to the Museo del Prado, um, and finally, in 1992, I believe, um, it was moved from the Prado to the Museo Nacional Centro de Arte Reinas or Sofia, the the uh, national Art Center of Queen Sofia in Madrid, where you can see it today uh, if you have some time and you're in Madrid and you don't mind an hour or so wait because there's a rather lengthy line. But I digress, we got to move on. Oh, here we go one more time. Here's a picture of the mural. So, for the purposes of our World War II class, the Spanish Civil War was highly significant. It proved to be a training ground for fascist armies and a place where new weapons could be tested, as we indicated earlier. Um, I think it led to closer rapport between Mussolini and Hitler. Now, we have to back up a little bit. Um, early on in the, uh, in the relationship, Mussolini and Hitler um, kind of viewed each other with some distrust um, during the uh, early German efforts at Anschluss, at the annexation of Austria. Mussolini actually opposed Hitler, so there was quite a bit of tension. And Mussolini, too, um, Hitler had looked up to Mussolini for many years, and Mussolini looked a little bit uh, condescendingly toward Hitler. And I think this was a moment in which uh, they were sort of equals. Of course, that would change by 1939, 1940, when Mussolini would become the junior partner, and Hitler would you know, speak disdainfully of Mussolini. Um, this was definitely a media war. It was also a war in which... Um, Thousands of uh, Americans went overseas, uh, mostly in support of the Republicans, um, working as volunteers, as uh, as medics, as uh, as mercenaries. Um, European tensions definitely increased at this time. There was a great deal of pressure on the uh, democracies of Europe, especially Britain and France, to do something, and they mostly sat this one out, which uh, of course. Um, kind of emboldened Mussolini and Hitler. Um, finally, civilians were targeted uh, as a way to terrorize the opposition in a way that was uh, different for its time period. Of course, we, we sort of accept the idea of collateral damage or even um, direct attacks on civilians, but uh, this was still in its infancy, at least in terms of uh, standard military practice. And uh, this draws to a close our discussion of the Spanish Civil War.